This week, the United States released its first national education report card in three years. And the country's performance was worthy of a long stint in detention. Fourth and eighth graders recorded the largest drop in math scores ever. Reading scores fell to levels last recorded in 1992. And inequalities between rich students and their poorer peers deepened. It's the latest, most representative evidence of the pandemic-induced education crisis in the U.S. The question is, how do we fix it? My next guest says he has the answer. Sal Khan is the CEO of Khan Academy, a nonprofit that provides lessons to students online. Sal, welcome. So w when you saw this, uh, this evidence to begin with, um, wh what was your reaction? It wasn't surprising, and I, I don't think I, I was alone there. But, but I think what is maybe a little bit surprising even before this is why people weren't viewing it as an emergency even before the pandemic. Just to reframe some of the numbers you just cited, uh, things went down both in math and reading. The worst results were in eighth grade math, where pre-pandemic, about a third of students in the U.S. were proficient in math. So that was pretty horrible. And now it's a fourth. So even though things just got dramatically worse, uh, it, 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 it was pretty bad before. And it, and it was, so it wasn't just the pandemic, although the pandemic definitely made things worse. So in some ways, the kind of central question, and I think you're the perfect person to ask this to is during the pandemic, large amounts of the education that people were getting in person went online. And it seems like that online experience was terrible for educational outcomes. Now, you're the king of online education. So why did online education not work during the pandemic? Yeah, it's a great question. And I always like to differentiate between online versus remote. Uh, what did happen during the pandemic, and uh, can't blame anyone, they didn't have a lot of time to plan this, is that the same traditional academic model where you have 20, 30 students in a classroom, for the most part, listening lectures, that just got transferred to Zoom somewhat overnight, where now st students are sitting in on Zoom calls for four or five hours a day. And you can imagine those were very, very disengaging. And so what happened during the pandemic, it wasn't necessarily the technology, it was just that it just became even more disengaging. A lot of kids just fell off of the radar and weren't able to engage in their education. On the other hand, you can do online learning. And when Khan Academy is used best, it's used inside of a classroom with people next to each other. Students are able to work at their own pace on things that are relevant to them. The teacher is able to walk around and have more personal one-on-one -on -one interaction, actually more human-to-human -human interaction than they would get in a traditional lecture-based classroom. The students are encouraged to not put their fingers on their lips, but are actually encouraged to talk to each other and help each other. So it's not about online versus not online. It's about are you leveraging human connection? Are, are there ways to engage students and have them work on what matters for them versus things that are less less engaging? And that's the less engaging is what happened during the pandemic. It does seem to me, Sal, that a lot of what makes people learn is the social setting, that they're with friends, that they're trying to impress their, their peers or they're competing with them or they're, you know, that there's a social element to it, which which almost makes it comfortable for the education to for them to receive the education. But to just sit in front of a Zoom for five, six hours, and all you're getting is the education with none of that social, uh, social dynamic, seems very, very suboptimal. No one agrees more than myself with that statement. But what I think what's interesting right now is the solution isn't to just say, hey, we're never going to use a computer again. The solution is to say, okay, we have the students back on campus. We, they can engage with each other. What is the optimal engagement? And that is, don't just keep shepherding them lockstep. Half the kids are bored, half the kids are lost. Let them get as much practice and feedback as possible on things that are actually going to be useful for them. And the online part allows for that tailoring of you know, each student matching up to the level and the problems that they can deal with, right? That's right. It, it, you know, before, if you go back, I'll go 2,300 years back intentionally, if you go back to time of Alexander the Great, he had a personal tutor named Aristotle. That's about as good as an education can get. 200 years ago, we had a very utopian idea of let's have free mass public education. But we said we can't give everyone an Aristotle. So we borrowed tools from the Industrial Revolution. Let's move students lockstep. Let's apply some lectures to them. Every few weeks, we will get assessment. The kids who are doing all right, we'll track them into the top of the, the labor pyramid. 
some kids in the middle, some kids in the bottom. That's not acceptable anymore. It wasn't acceptable pre-pandemic. And then the, the pandemic just put a bigger spotlight on we can't do the, the same as usual and hope to get a better result. Uh, you know, as you know, that's oftentimes the, the definition of insanity, uh, expecting a different outcome by doing the same thing. We have to move to this level of personalization. Try to get approximate what Alexander the Great had, but obviously we can't have one on one for everybody. So this is where online personalized learning is important. And, and you know, I'm not selling anything. People might think of, this is all free. It's not for profit. Everyone listening can use it. They can tell their school about it. And the more people that use it, I have to go out there and raise more money for it. All right. Well, I always get smarter listening to you. So, Salkan, always a pleasure. Thanks, Reed.